In our current sermon series each week, we're taking a look at some of the hymns that we as a congregation have sung most frequently over the last four or five years. And today we are looking at the hymn Amazing Grace. And so for our second reading, we turn to Romans, uh, one of many parts of the New Testament where Paul addresses the subject of grace. We're in the third chapter. It can be found on page 154 in the New Testament of your pew Bible. Let us listen together for God's word. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For, though the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. What a gift Your grace is to us, O God. This morning as we hear Your Word and Your voice by the power of Your Spirit, may we become more aware of that gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. These famous words, the words to the hymn Amazing Grace, were penned by John Newton. His story now is pretty well known. Back in 2008 or 9, a movie was made called Amazing Grace that told in part the story of his life. He was an insubordinate, profane youth. He went into service in the Royal Navy. This is in the 18th century. Eventually, he deserted the Navy. Really, he took a leave to visit a woman he'd fallen in love with and decided to extend his leave without permission, ultimately, until he had, in effect, deserted. After deserting the Navy, he went and he joined a ship in the Atlantic slave trade. There, on that ship, among sailors who we all know have a reputation, deserved or not, I'm sure we have some Navy people in the room, for profanity and obscenity, he gained a reputation among sailors for being especially obscene, on occasion inventing his own obscenities to outdo those that were in common use at the time. In 1748, a violent storm struck his ship and he called out to God for mercy. And he survived the storm. And this was for him the beginning of his conversion. As he was waiting for that ship to be repaired, he wrote the first verse to the hymn. He left the slave trade altogether and took up the study of Christian theology. About 20 years later, he was ordained in the Church of England. And shortly after that, he penned the rest of the words to the hymn that we now sing today. This hymn, when it was originally written, was obscure in England, but it became very popular in the United States among uh, revivalists who were traveling all over the country. It is probably the most familiar, most popular hymn in the United States. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. These words are as much a part of the American religious experience as grace is a part of Christianity. But we Christians have done something interesting with the idea of grace. Grace is supposed to be simple. Grace is supposed to be straightforward and clear. And yet most of the complexities when it comes to talking about Christian theology or how Christianity relates to other religions, most of these difficulties are somehow wrapped up in this idea of grace. Growing up, it was often introduced to me as that which sets Christianity apart from other religions, that grace is what is especially unique about Christianity. It would come out in in something like all other religions require this, that, and the other thing. Judaism requires you to obey the Ten Commandments or to follow the law or to keep kosher. Islam requires you to abide by the five pillars of submission. In Hinduism and Buddhism, you have to follow these steps in order to achieve nirvana. In all of these religions, you have to do, do, do. But in Christianity, you don't because of grace. Now, this is fine. 
As far as it goes, grace is central to Christianity. Christianity is unique in the emphasis that it places upon grace compared to other religions. But here's the problem. We have come to think, I think, that Christianity owns grace. And it doesn't. In all of our talk about grace, instead of saying something of substance about the amazing grace of the God that we worship, instead we've chosen to weaponize grace in our effort to elevate Christianity above other religions. If Christianity exists, or rather if grace existed solely within the confines of the Christian religion, it wouldn't be amazing grace. But the grace that we see in the story of God, in the story of God's people, in the story of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, in the story of the church since then, the grace that we see in the story of God is so much bigger, so much more amazing. The first thing that is amazing about grace is that it's not ours. It's not ours. Almost as soon as Christianity became an entity unto itself, something separate from Judaism, something with its own emerging structure of leadership, its own writings, its own sacred texts, as soon as Christianity existed in this way, grace came under the watchful care of the theological authorities who wanted everything to be tagged and cataloged and filed properly. Grace became a thing, and this thing belonged to to the church. And once the church holds the patent on grace, the church has a solemn duty to protect it, to place sensible limits on it, to regulate access to it. This is what we do when we possess something, whether it's grace or a beautifully restored car. We make sure only certain people get in the driver's seat. We make sure it only goes out in certain kinds of weather. When we possess something, when we feel that something belongs to us, we protect it. It's a sensible thing to do. And the church has done the same thing with grace. My three and a half year old daughter does something that always makes me laugh. I will be doing something and she will out of the blue come up to me and in a very serious, a serious tone of voice as a three and a half year old can muster, she'll say, Daddy, I have to go to the airport. I say, why are you going to the airport? And she'll say, I'm, I have to fly to Florida. We have family in Florida. So she often imagines flying there. Um, and so I decide to, to play along, to enter the imaginative moment for her. And I say, well, uh, be sure you pack some snacks for the flight. And she'll say to me, oh, Daddy, I'm just pretending. <laughs> Here I am, the adult far less imaginative than my daughter. I am the one with the firm grasp of reality here. I am the one who knows where the imagination begins and ends. I'm the one in control, entering into the play, all the while knowing what's going on. I know all the rules. I'm the omniscient, omnipotent one here in this relationship. And then the rules get subverted on me. I try to play along, and my daughter uh, reminds me that I'm not, I'm not fit for this imaginative play. I have violated the rules somehow, and I'm the one supposed to be writing the rules. We've done something similar with the idea of grace. We've treated grace as a thing that can be defined, contained, and constrained, and then we've acted as if God has to abide by the rules that we've set. God has to play by our rules. God's grace has to work within our definition of grace. And so we forget that grace is just a word. Grace is just a human idea. It's a word that we employ to try to capture, to try to express something about the inexpressible God and the way that this God interacts with us and with the world. Grace is not ours. Grace belongs to God. Anyone who tells you what you need to do in order to obtain or have access to God's grace is selling a bill of false goods. They're offering you ordinary, human grace, but not amazing grace. Grace is not ours to distribute or to define, to administer or to regulate. Grace is not ours. Grace is God's. The second thing that's amazing about grace is that it's not fair. 
Once we get a hold of something as limitless as grace, we have a natural tendency to make it conform to our rules. And our rules are governed by principles of fair exchange. This is how human society works and functions. We use phrases like, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Everything comes at a cost. You have to pay the piper. I'm sure many of you, as I held up that library card and told the children it didn't cost me anything, are thinking, my property taxes paid for that library card, right? There's no free lunch. This is how the world works. And so it becomes impossible for us to really conceive of what a gift is, something that breaks this cycle of fair exchange, something like grace. But Paul helps us along with this wonderful phrase, there is no distinction. Paul has spent the first three chapters of Romans building up the tension that exists between Jews and Gentiles. A tension that Jews who have now become Christians have grown up with. They know this tension. And Paul is saying that there is no distinction. Of course, he goes on to say, For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We're with you on that one, Paul. We know there's no distinction in sin. We know we're all sinners. We get that. But Paul goes on, and he says, they are justified freely by his grace as a gift, to which we say to Paul, not so fast, not so fast. We're not going to go quite that far down the road with you, Paul, because that doesn't quite sound fair, that doesn't quite sound proper. When I was a kid growing up in Southern California, there was a, a camp up in the mountains that a uh, church camp that we would go to twice a year. And in the summertime, for elementary school kids, the camp was called Indian Village. We'd sleep in teepees and do all kinds of Indian, I should say Native American. I bet they've changed the name by now from Indian Village. <laughs> Native American activities and, and things. But one of the things that stands out in my memory is they'd give us a booklet. Uh, every summer I went. And that booklet would sort of guide us through the different uh, activities and Bible studies of the week. And every day there was a memory verse. And if you remember, if you memorize that memory verse, then you got something. I don't remember what it was, but you, you earned something by the end of the week for remembering all of those verses. And one of the ones that stuck out to me that I've never forgotten is Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, I know they need to keep these verses short because they're asking third, fourth, and fifth graders to memorize them. But I wonder now, looking back, why they chose verse 23 and not verse 24, which says, all are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And I think the answer is that it only makes sense for one to precede the other, right? Right? We have to acknowledge our sin before we can receive and appreciate God's grace. There is a proper order to things. There is a proper fairness that we can't violate. And of course, being that it's a Christian summer camp, they're working toward that decision of faith at the end of the week. And an important part of that is making us recognize our sinfulness. I understand that, but I think we have the order backwards. I think that we've turned it around. Instead of putting our repentance before grace, we should put grace, God's grace, before our repentance. In some materials that I've used over the years for officer training, the author of this book highlights an important distinction when it comes to this the subject that Paul addresses that we call justification, our being made right with God. And it addresses the issue of works Righteousness. You've probably heard that phrase before. The idea that we are made right with God through the things that we do. Our actions make us right with God. Right? And this idea was, was cast aside very, uh, very uh, powerfully during the Protestant Reformation. The Reformers uh, said that absolutely not. It is by grace alone through faith that we are made right with God. But the author of this officer training material um, adds a second caveat to this idea of justification by grace through faith. He says there's another kind of works righteousness, and he calls it beliefs righteousness. The idea that in order to be made right with God, we have to believe the right things about God. Now, different Christian traditions have phrased this belief 
differently or have understood it differently. But the basic idea is that if you believe X, Y, and Z, then you may receive God's grace and forgiveness and salvation. But what this boils down to, what this amounts to, is that our work, in this case it happens to be an intellectual one, and only one, and not a series of physical acts throughout our entire life, this one work is what accomplishes our salvation. Which is offered freely, but there's this catch. And grace with a catch cannot be grace. Now John Newton, the author of the hymn, Amazing Grace, was slow to convert. I haven't seen the movie in a long time. I don't know if the movie captured this. It took a good six or seven years for John Newton, after his conversion, finally to decide to leave the slave trade behind him. Another ten years after that, to decide to enter ordained ministry. This was not a lightning quick process. First, John Newton experienced God's amazing grace. And then he set about his old ways. And then came the repentance. Grace did not result of a transaction between John Newton and God. And at the end of the day, Newton proved himself worthy and God's grace was given. God's grace came to Newton as a gift. Out of nowhere. A free gift. Grace is not fair. The third thing that's amazing about grace is that it's not done. We often think about grace as a vaccine. It's a shot that we get to inoculate us against sin, to protect us from condemnation and death. But the effectiveness varies. It's up to us whether or not it takes. We might need to revisit the doctor for a booster from time to time. But instead of thinking of grace as a vaccine, we should think of grace as a companion. In the Presbyterian Church, as in many Protestant traditions, we affirm one baptism. That is, we believe that uh, a disciple needs to be baptized only one time. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but only once. It doesn't matter if it was a Methodist who did it, or a Catholic who did it, or a Presbyterian, or some crazy preacher out in the fields. If it was done in the name of the triune God, it is sufficient. Now, not every tradition believes this about baptism. There are traditions that will baptize again and again under the understanding that our sins need to be washed away again. And without trying to disparage those traditions, the affirmation that we make as Presbyterians when we affirm one baptism is to affirm that God's grace is sufficient for us. That that one baptism, the baptism which represents for all of us who are seated in the sanctuary as much as it does for the child or the adult who has the water placed on their head, it signifies God's grace at work in our lives. God's grace at work every day, every moment of our lives, which is why we need that reminder at a baptism to remember the sacrament, to remember our own baptism, the one we can't remember because we were too young when it happened, to remember the power of God's grace at work in our lives because grace is not done. Grace is a constant companion through each and every day of our lives. Grace is constantly working on us, working on our hearts. So you see, grace is not difficult or complicated at all. Grace is very simple, and Paul is trying to make it crystal clear. There is no distinction. We've all sinned. And we've all been justified freely by God's grace as a gift. Newton writes, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. 